trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Dyson Podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is William von der Palen, and in Copenhagen still is Isak Rautio. What's up, Isak? Still here. One day I'm not going to be here, but <laughs> so far, still here. Nice to see you, William. How, how, is, it doing? how, how is it doing? How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> how is the William doing? Yeah, it's, uh, everything is good, thanks. Uh, it's, uh, That's nice. Uh, slushy, slushy November here in, in uh, Finland, but we have a... We have a very interesting guest uh, uh, at the other side of the world uh, once again. So wel- welcome, Jessica Rolf from uh, Love Every. Thank you for having me. It's super, super great to have you uh, have you on the show. And you're in Idaho, right? Yes, in Boise, Idaho. We were just joking before this that it's a flyover state, but <laughs> <laughs> it's been well, much said- more in demand, actually, because, you know, the kind of migration now to live anywhere is uh, Boise is coming to the top of the list for a lot of people in America. Right. Yeah, that's happening. Is Have you noticed it in your in your uh, neighborhoods or in the city in general? Yes, we have a huge uh, amount of influx of people coming from various parts of the country. And it's been making recruiting really easy, actually. Right. Yeah, you probably get a lot of, uh, I guess, high skilled, uh, engaged people from all over the uh, the US, the coasts? Yes. It used to be that we would, you know, really work hard to convince people to move to Boise, but now it's become a lot more appealing. So Yeah, that's is that kind of a trend because we're seeing that with Finland as well. Like we're getting we're still in the middle of nowhere, but but people are starting to realize that, you know, the coronavirus was handled quite well here and, and otherwise also this is is a good country to be in in many ways. Uh and, and there's this talk about Silicon Valley and, and the apartments and the rents uh rising and, and becoming sky high uh, around the city so is this a trend or is it still is silicon valley still the place to be for you know most people you know it's interesting when we first started love every my co-founder and i really wondered if we could create a venture-backed high scale scaling very quickly business outside of the valley or outside of these major metro areas and it was it was a question and now i think it's um become you know totally more accepted and i think that Uh, you know, I think that it's still great to live in sort of like the hub, but I think that it's all really also really working to live outside of these major areas. What do you think are the main benefits or even, I, I guess, drawbacks, but I guess mainly the benefits of, of uh, working, I guess, specifically out of Idaho, but just from outside from outside of these big hubs? Yeah, you know, I mean, we all know you, you are entrepreneurs too. But living an entrepreneurial life is very stressful and it's really intense. And so if you have a good airport, you know, that's close by that you can get to most places, that's that's key. But it's also really nice to have a really kind of chill, mellow backdrop to your intense life. So being able to go to the store, you don't have to wait in lines and fight for what you need or, you know, people are kind of generally kind and there's less friction in the rest of life. And I think that it's really helpful for entrepreneurs who are building and under a lot of stress to be able to have sort of a low stress uh, environment. Right. And you came from New York, so traffic's probably a big thing too. Yeah, it's been uh, a huge difference coming from New York City. I thought we'd uh, start off with with your background a bit, since um, uh, this is not the the first time you founded a successful company. You you did that also in the in the past once. So maybe just you know, could you give the listeners a brief background of of um, what you've done so far and uh, yeah, what what you're doing uh, right now as well. Yeah, I've always been passionate about the intersection of kind of early life and childhood, and also socially responsible businesses. And you know, I when I first started my career, I was admiring people like Seth Goldman from Honest Tea or Anita Roddick from The Body Shop, and the sort of like uh, these these icons of how to merge business with purpose. And there was this, you know, obviously it's a much more evolved movement now, but there was sort of a, a, a new it was new thinking, um, you know, 20 years ago. And so I co-founded a company called Happy Baby, which is now the number one selling organic baby food company in the country. We took on Gerber, which is, which was a really big deal um, at the time. And it was kind of sort of fought through every um, challenge imaginable in building that business. And now we're number two to Gerber. So it's been a really exciting, that was a really exciting journey as my first company. 
Uh, I had a great co-founder. Um, we both, you know, really worked hard to achieve that vision. And then we sold the company Happy Family to Group Danone in 2012 and had a three-year earnout um, to complete that journey and still an advisor to that company. But I just found myself really having the itch again to build. And, you know, I think that we can talk about you know, sort of what it's like to be a serial entrepreneur and all of the sort of self-doubt or the challenges that come with that. But had, had a, it to me what felt like an inevitable sort of purpose-driven idea in early childhood around stage-based learning. So I'd sort of gone deep in early nutrition and have my own family of three children but then found myself really feeling confident about what I was feeding them. They were eating sardines at one and, you know, having all this best nutrition, but really wondering what was happening with their developing brain. And it felt like a real kind of empty space for me of not knowing what was happening with my, my, my babies. And, you know, I can tell you later, but I discovered a doctoral thesis on infant brain development and was inspired to create Love Every. There's, before we go into the companies themselves, I have an interesting, uh, I think uh, this is a really interesting point that like a lot of different people have different takes on it. Uh, but it's it's this, the difference of thinking from whatever old mindset people had versus this new uh, social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship that's striving for some so, sort of uh, impact. And and uh, it's sometimes hard to put your finger on what the specific difference is. But like, what do you, what do you think uh, in your mind is the, or are the main differences between this new mindset or way of thinking about entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, I think we all have such a deep purpose, right? Like everybody has a purpose and we feel like, you know, just connecting to that and being able to see that and really kind of live that is is what's important. I think that the, that social responsibility and impact can be can take so many different forms right now. For me, it's in the early childhood space, but I think that we're now kind of asking business to, you know, serve multiple roles in society too. It's not just government and nonprofits that are solving society's, you know, highest level problems of course. And so, you know, I, I think that it's really kind of like a recognition of that and, and, a, and a recognition that we're all kind of here for a reason and, and try and help tap into that and, and bring our best selves to, to our work to, to benefit the most people. Yeah, that seems like a really big shift and we're starting because I remember still like it's not that long ago that when you said things like, you know, Uh, you can make a profit while doing great things or, you know, solving big problems. People would kind of frown and said that you can't combine those two things. And, and then, but then the counter argument started, started coming that, okay, but the best minds in the world are still, you know, uh, creating games or, or doing something that's, you know, it's important, but it's, it's incentivized in a proper way versus maybe solving the global, global challenges. And, and, and if you compare that or, or then add the, the consumers, Uh, who are starting to demand more? It, it seems like this is quite inevitable, and it's going to just keep on, keep on going now for, hopefully, for a long time. I think you made the gamers really angry there, William. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> sorry, sorry, gamers. <laughs> I, yeah. I know. I get. You, I get your points. It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. What do you uh, What do you think about that, Jessica? Like uh, this, uh, this new, uh, uh, are. are uh, entrepreneurs less incentivized to, I guess, I mean, I'm going to make them angry again now, but waste their time in a sense and not sort yeah. of engage with some problems in society. I mean, I, I think that's a couple of things. One that, that that brings up for me is it's just table stakes now to mm. be a positive contributor to society. So it's not like, you know, creating sustainably harvested wood toys with organic materials and offsetting all of your carbon is, you know, is sort of this, this thing to be like really admired and celebrated. It's like, of course, like, of course, the children, the children's toys that my, you know, the toys that my, my baby and my child are going to play with is going to be respectful of the world that they're growing up in. And so I think it's just, it's, And that's really driven by consumers, which I think has been a very powerful movement. Uh, I think that it's it's been interesting um, kind of experiencing um, the racial justice movement in the U.S. and realizing how much work we have to do as a company and feeling kind of historically ahead of the curve and now feeling like, wow, there is so much more to do and feeling a little bit more on the defensive or behind the curve as a, as a company founder during this time. It's like we really have to dig deep and think about how we can um, make a difference in these sort of intractable, which seems like these, you know, kind of historically intractable issues that we need to, we need to own up to these and make progress. Yeah. How much do, do you think that your, 
experience with with your previous company and and the success with you had with it has helped you in in the, this new endeavor and and how have you have you seen that um, in general? Yeah, I mean it's always like you know a, a, um, a real experience to kind of say I'm going to do this again. You know, it's <laughs> like you have to kind of hold hands with your family and your you know everybody, but you you know but you also kind of realize a sort of either this irresistible pull towards. Um, building something, and so my first company that I co-founded was we had so, we had so many challenges. You know, we really learned from scratch how to build a company that could again take on the very established category, and you know, we're feeding vulnerable um, a vulnerable population their first bites of food, and so that responsibility, I think, you know, for me in particular, kind of my role was in the product development side and sort of managing quality and innovation, and that was. A re- I learned a very deep lesson in the responsibility of business, and you know, investors barely asked about you know, sort of what are your safety protocols, what you know, how do you manage quality, how do you manage your factory relationships. They want to talk about the marketing and the vision for the brand, um, and how we're going to you know be in retail and which rich retail stores and how many. But I think for me, I got very grounded in in the responsibility that I had as a as a you know co-founder of a business that was serving babies and so took that responsibility i think to um definitely to co-founding uh love every with rod morris my co-founder and we you know we we take sort of these sort of core principles around you know babies first and you know their health is the most important to to the founding of love every Yeah, do you think you would you would have grown as fast um, without the past experience? It probably helped you, or has it helped you? You know, raise uh, capital uh, quicker and and navigate some early early challenges that you. Of course, there's going to be like new challenges uh, rising along the way that you haven't seen before. But um, could you maybe like dodge dodge a few of them and and get uh, get kind of a quicker start than than the last time? Yes, I I definitely think that. You don't realize how much you learn from experience until you do it again. You're like, this is actually feeling a little easier. Like it's hard, but it's going faster. And there's some things that are flowing that I didn't expect to flow so quickly. Um, you almost kind of expect it to be like the first time. So uh, with all of the challenges, and you sort of brace yourself. But it definitely has. We've been scaling quicker, and I feel like we were able to, you know, raise capital a little bit easier. It's still hard. It's still really hard. You see the doubt in people's, you know, eyes and those like first raises that seed round and the Series A. You haven't really proven much. You know, you can can they can she really do? Can she is she really a serial entrepreneur? Can she really nail this again? Um, but you know, we we felt like I felt like I was sort of prepared. My co-founder is also very experienced, Rod Morris, and you know, he we sort of brought that experience together to bear, and things have gone smoother. I will say, knock on wood. <laughs> That's a it's an interesting point. The 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 fact that you don't really even understand what experience you get from experience and how it uh, and and I mean it, sometimes uh, I mean obviously experience is also explicit skills and explicit habits you learn. But then it's also the, this is a weird analogy. I just just came to mind. But in the in Finland we have the mandatory military service, and I remember we had marches all the time in the army. Uh, and and I remember they started as very short, and then they became longer and longer and longer. I remember the the, the first one was the hardest. Uh, the shortest one was the hardest because every step was new, kind of, and you didn't really know how long it was going to be. They said it was going to be five kilometers. I don't know how many miles that is. If there's any North American listeners, but um, uh, but but because every step was new, I didn't really know how long five kilometers would feel with the heavy backpack and everything. And then after that the 40 kilometer 50 kilometer marches felt way easier because and and you realize that as you're doing it because you've had the experience you know what it feels like and you've been through that before weird analogy but i think it somehow works i think it really does too yeah i i 100% believe that it it i keep waiting for this to sort of mirror the last experience in the sort of grit that it requires and the intensity and the sort of all the things going wrong at the same time which it really kind of felt like we, you know, had an, a lot of luck in mm. in being able to scale Happy Family. And, you know, I I just we're we have a it's challenging. It's it's hard. You know, there's so much to to do in building and scaling a business, but we've seen a lot of earlier success. It's been um we've surpassed what took us seven years to get with Happy Family. It took us seven years to get to a revenue mark we're getting in three years with Love Every. 
Yeah, and that's so. quite significant uh, mm. when you say it out loud. So it's uh, faster than than half the time. Uh, so you've obviously learned learned something. Every company is, is obviously also different, but uh, um, that's probably like one of the best best uh, measurements still. If if you're like growing growing that fast, what what have been some some of the there's like no one single key usually, but what have been some of the things you've you've done right to to achieve that kind of growth? Um, it's interesting. I mean, there's always, as an entrepreneur, we always wonder how much of this is luck and how much of this is, you know, intention and hard work. And I think it's both. Uh, this time we did a lot more testing. And so we're really, I think, have been very rigorous in applying the concepts around design thinking to our, to building out the, the initial offering for Love Every and then cons- consecutive offerings. It's amazing how many companies, especially if you take a space that hasn't, there haven't seen a ton of innovation and in the baby toy space, imagine all the sort of like plastic toys with the flashing lights and, you know, and or or the simple wood toys that sort of are boring to your baby or to your younger child. You know, there's, there's that, those perfect wood toys that are just really interesting and dynamic and well-designed. And uh, but if you think about it, there haven't been a, there hasn't been a ton of innovation in in the sort of space, especially the space that we first launched in, which is this play gym um, that we created. There was tons of products in the category, and you know I think that um, for us we just we did a ton of testing and we did we w- went to a lot of parents' homes. We did use a design thinking model where we kind of created a bell curve of 25 families that we wanted to um, have the sort of experience of Love Every with and followed their baby's growth and journey for for nine months. So we would travel around the country and go into their homes pre-COVID and and really kind of hear and and notice the other stuff that they had in their home, notice how they talked with their baby, how they, what they were saying maybe was incongruent with their, you know, kind of behaviors. Um, And I think that we didn't do that at Happy Family. We launched a frozen baby food product in Cubes and you know, retailers loved it. Investors thought it was innovative, and parents kind of it. It wasn't actually a hit, and so I think that all that kind of testing up front got us to a much faster product market fit. Yeah, how do you see that in general? Because there, like, you hear different opinions on that matter. Like, should you test and and uh, you know create a good product in in your garage, so to say, and then when you're ready, you you will you will launch it uh, versus just you know creating something a minimum viable product or just something that barely works and trying the market and, and then improving radically and very quickly. Um, so does it depend on the, the, the company and, and um, the product or is there a better way to, to go go about it? Yeah, I mean, in our space, I would say that we did both. So one of the core principles in design thinking is to pre- you know put in front of your um, testers really ugly prototypes. If you give mm. them a really polished version of something, they sort of feel bad. They don't want to hurt your feelings, and you know, say, oh, mm. you know, this this okay. that I don't want to hurt her feelings. This looks too good, and so I'm just going to be really nice to her because she worked really hard on this. But if you put something really ugly in front of them, that's you know hacked together with cardboard or, you know, hand sewn or whatever it was. And for us, we had a local woodworker kind of, you know, try to do our, we did our best, but it was not the vision um, for Love Every. We, we wanted to just get that prototype out in front of customers as soon as we could. Then they feel more um, able. It's, it's embarrassing for you, but it's they're more able to feel like they can really give you some good feedback. For the baby category and physical products in general, I think it can be, there's a real divide between sort of like how you can approach innovation on the digital side versus how you approach it in the physical product side. And I think that physical products, especially in a category that really demands trust, like baby development, you need to put out your best. When you're launching your product, it needs to be really polished and tight and obviously, you know, meeting international standards for safety and quality. And, you know, it needs to be really right. And so we, we haven't made a whole lot of modifications to our, um, you know, kind of our initial offering to what is working now. We're constantly tweaking and constantly kind of looking at um, nuances of, you know, what might go into our stage-based learning program versus what what might not be as helpful, but it, but the core kind of elements of the experience have, have been very similar to what we launched with. Can you speak a bit more on the the paper you read that sort of started this whole process? Uh, was this kind of a nerding out process where you just found this and then you uh, sort of 
do- deep dove into it and and uh, and uh, how how did you go about learning stuff from an academic journal and then transitioning that into a product that you can sell yeah i mean i think for me again you know there's so much that's happening in our children's development between zero and three and you know in europe there's a lot more of a recognition for the importance of early life in america a lot of the kind of parent mindset is it's like you get what you get um i turned out okay and it's mostly genetics Right. It's like the, the American mindset is it's mostly genetics. And um, and so these experience, these kind of skills will naturally unfold in a baby, especially for babies. And, you know, there's more of a focus on later education. Once they get into kindergarten, if they need you know help, then we then we start investing in the kids then in America in general. Um, so what we were asking for is I, I noticed this sort of um generation of a desire and a hunger for n- more nerdy edgy knowledge around early childhood and so i was i was at a birthing i had a birthing class for my first baby and my birthing instructor had a little library of resources and one of those resources was the spiral bound doctoral thesis that this um, gentleman named will stasso had written 20 years ago and so i i borrowed it i checked it out of her library it had never really been published and um, checked it out of her library and then uh, read it, re- just started to read it. And, you know, there was a kind of front section where it was all about how to have the brain is structured. And I, I didn't, I didn't find that to be as valuable. What I found so valuable about what he had created was this, this program of activities and things that I could do that really tuned into these development windows that were opening and closing in my baby's brain. And it was just, it was very, it was really felt fresh. It was like house taking your two baby on a tour of their house, of your house and opening and closing cupboards and taking out a glass and showing them how water is poured or going and turning on and off all the lights in the house. So very simple activities, but he he grounded it in a very kind of science backs programmatic way. And so I, I found myself for years just thinking, feel, feeling so confident with my baby's development after I discovered this, you know, kind of document and this um, program. And then really just like wanting to create a, a an early learning program for parents. The question is, is would they really want to lean in? And, and absolutely this generation of parents is asking for more. They're not interested in this sort of, um, Let's let's let it let's see how it turns out. You know, they want to be active participants in their children's development, and they want to feel good about it. Yeah, that's probably a good good trend overall. Um, it seems seems like a good idea. Um, one thing that that strikes me at least is that you know most companies that we idolize, that we talk about, even that we bring on this podcast, maybe uh, in the long run, are somewhat like very technically driven tech companies. Uh, platform businesses uh, or social media, something like this, and this is what we idolize. And and yet, there seems seems to be a lot of superb opportunities in very, so to speak, old-fashioned businesses or even like product businesses that we aren't doing anything about. And then there's this discussion that you know, should you have your own uh, creative uh, once in a lifetime idea versus just improving something that exists? Um, so what do you think we can do to, you know, get more people to realize that there are quite a lot of opportunities and, and your purpose doesn't necessarily have to be building the next big tech company, because let's face it, I think most people will not do that since the competition is, is just very, very big in that space. Yeah. I mean, I think it comes down to kind of like how we see ourselves and how to um, kind of strip back what we see as expectations of who we are. And, you know, kind of, like, I'm going to be the tech entrepreneur and I'm going to, this is what this looks like for me in my life. And this is what success looks like. And try and strip that down to kind of saying, what is my, again, what do I really care about? And what is, um, what do I feel like I can contribute to? And if you look at, you know, I, it's true. I mean, I, you know, baby food and baby toys, my co-founder in particular had built, had brought his last company to over a billion dollars in value and got it, you know, went public. And it was this really exciting kind of journey for him. He was on the executive team and for him to kind of have the awareness that he was, he saw the intention of, you know, this, this concept for love every and saw the the possibilities and was like, you know, this, this very successful, um, man to then come join a, you know, a co-founder to build a toy company, which can be perceived as a toy company. Again, we're building, you know, this sort of system of early learning, but the outside, on the outside world, you know, people kind of first judged us as having toys took a lot of, I, I admire that a lot. And I think that we, 
we are backed by Google Ventures. We're you know scaling super quickly. We have Mavron behind us, Chan Zuckerberg. We're going to be a you know the, we really have a vision for being a multi billion dollar brand in service to families globally. Um, but but that is you know something that's going to take a lot of you know sort of time and and like ego strength to sort of push through the sort of uh, versions of uh, of ourselves of what success we thought would look like. Um, in the beginning, for me, for me, it's it's always been as long as I can sort of realize why why I'm doing what I'm doing and that I'm doing it for the for sort of the the right reasons. Um, that has always led me to um, to kind of good outcomes. You mentioned you've gotten funding from a lot of uh, I guess high places uh, and pretty big players, if that's a right way to put it. We've spoken a lot about VC funding in general and, and a lot of the structures around it and the dynamics of the deals and uh, and so on, but not as much about what it's like to be in the room uh, when you're actually negotiating it and, and just going through the motions. So uh, can you tell your, I guess, favorite story or stories about how how that happened? Maybe Maybe your sort of most memorable no and your most memorable yes. Hmm. Um, well, the most memorable no came with my first company, um, Happy Baby, Happy Family. And I remember, you know, it's just, uh, we put together a round of half a, half a million dollars, which seemed like a massive amount of money. And uh, it took us uh, over a year to raise this these funds. And we were raising them on a convertible note. So we were bringing in capital and then spending it as fast as we had it to try and build value to the company. And we were taking in you know, checks for like $2,500 a, a pop. So we had a lot of investors. And, and I think that we had one call in particular that was just the most brutally honest, um, rude, it's like... Uh, female founder investor that we had ever spoken to. I think we got, you know, we were always taking calls, getting connected through various kind of avenues. But I just remember her painting this whole picture of our lives of how we were going to mortgage our double mortgage our homes. And we were going to, you know, just have this absolute failure. And she was going to save us from even bothering to do this business because this was, you know, just going to be, wasn't going to work. And she was going to save us from, from financial failure as from like kind of one female to another kind of female team. And it was, it was rough. It was really rough. And I remember going to get a pint of ice cream. I just ate some ice cream afterwards. I was like, okay, resilience, just like, you know, process that and then eat some ice cream, do some emotional eating. And then um, the next day, you know, kind of get back and put one foot in front of the other and try and separate sort of the emotional side to just doing and getting things done, which I think is one of the key you know, tenants to success and as an entrepreneur is just kind of separate your emotions and just do and, and make progress. Um, do that next little step. Uh, I think that for Love Every, you know, as far as it, it just, it's, it's, it's always remarkably hard. You know, I think that I've seen, I've been in circles with other entrepreneurs and it just, it sounds really great. That, you know, Mavron, Google Ventures, Chan Zuckerberg, Reach Capital, we've got all these kind of great brands behind us. Um, yes, VC um, with Yuri. Nice. Uh, yes, and Kat- and Katarina. Um, but I think that there's, you know, there's this kind of process where you go through and you just have to kiss a lot of frogs. You have to. It's a numbers game, and it still is. And you know, the, the difference between somebody believing in you and and not, especially in the Series A and the seed, and even in the B, you're still raising on vision. And you know, I think that uh, for us, it was it was really taught, it was really hard. And my co-founder Rod is very diligent and disciplined about running a process. And he is he is just uh, you know like clockwork talking to investors. He's talking to them about our next funding round, even though we're not raising right now. But he is just constantly sort of engaging with investors and building up. And for us, it was you know both of us for the series uh, seed and series A and series B, but. You know, I think that we had a spreadsheet and it was just like, how do you go to somebody like Sequoia who said no to you the first time? And, you know, there's like, there were like 
I think we met with 30 funds for our series B. Um, and you know, a lot of those we had met with in the series A, how do you just like, show up again six months later after getting right. a no that you just get kind of, you're kind of pissed. You're just mm. like, you know, they said like, and it's just not, it's very inhuman to go to somebody, go back to somebody who rejected you for reasons that you may not agree with and you're frustrated with, and you've got some progress and you just get vulnerable again and you get in front of them. Hey, would you like to, would you like to hear an update? Would you like a 30, can, can we do schedule a 30 minute meeting? I'm going to be in town. You know, it's like, it's, it's a, um, it, you almost have to be a robot in a way um, to get through that process. But then, you know, I, I really strongly believe like we were able to close the series B with a phenomenal round of investors, but we had another 25 funds say no. And, um, and for us now in the series C, or, you know, sort of approaching now, it's like, now we're, you know, heading towards profitability. We've like, we're, um, have really successful, you know, retention rates. We have, you know, scaling business. And so we're getting, and so a lot of those people are coming back like, oh, I'd like to introduce you to our, to our growth fund or whoever it is. Um, and so it's, it's, um, but then I'm not anticipating this to be an easy route if we decide to go for funding a third, you know, for a series C, because it just is always hard. There's always something in the end, like that comes in. It just, it always looks better and easier than it really is. And it always looks easy in retrospect. Once you've, once you've done the work, it's only references on paper after that. So that, that's kind of a fallacy in a way, but, uh, but hopefully the series C will have, have the funds coming back to you and, and, and them being, you know, uh, at themselves for for saying no early on but probably the the problems or or the challenges you know uh change uh, since you've you've also had such rapid growth now in in three years so what are some um, some things you maybe didn't anticipate um as that would be problems are there something like that surprised you that is surprisingly hard when you when you hit certain milestones of scale hmm that's a good question um, I mean, scaling teams is always a challenge. I think for us, I mean, I think it's almost the flip is that we were really surprised by the acceleration of our business due to COVID. You know, I think that we were on an accelerated track in kind of December, January, we started really seeing kind of the organic kind of nature of the business, you know, um, starting to, to, um, the flywheel effect really working. And then, With, when COVID happened, um, I think you know it was it was kind of challenging in a lot of ways because it was there's this opportunity, there's a ton of demand, and yet you know we were asking our parent employees to work from home um, with their kids out of school, and we're all about you know attention to children and early childhood development, and we're asking them to take advantage of this. You know everybody, all these other you know there's a grab for content, there's a grab for you know sort of um, who you know who's talking about the, I need activity ideas for my two, two year old. I need, you know, there was just this hunger for our content, our demand. And so we had to push our team harder than ever. And then yet knowing that so many of us are really struggling as parents, um, parent employees. So I think it was sort of like a pot, definitely it's been a positive and a negative. We ended up, um, offering one-to-one -one childcare stipends and paying for people's, you know, to have a nanny come in. And then even then, you know, I think one of the hardest things was even then, in some cases, parents didn't feel comfortable with that. So then we were kind of in this awkward position of saying, well, we really need you to take advantage of this great opportunity we have in this special time. But um, we also had to really respect that, you know, safety is so important and, you know, our little people are the, the most important thing. So I'd say that that was this, a surprising challenge. That actually... Uh prompt another question regarding just what is it like this is something I know nothing about and William neither because we don't have families uh, of our own what is it like being an entrepreneur and balancing family life uh, yourself like what what is the how does how do you reconcile those two things in your schedules yeah I mean I'm not um it's it just I'm, I'm really always <laughs> working on it I will say it also is interesting to be the sort of like a female um, founder with young children and also trying to scale a business. Um, I, for me, it's about having like a messy house and sort of like not, you know, not being perfect in a lot of ways. Like I'm not wearing makeup for this interview. And I was like, Oh, I wish I was wearing makeup, but I was dealing with kids right before this. And, you know, it's just being able to kind of compromise on the things that aren't as important. Um, and, 
and then getting help. And so I, you know, um, be, what one thing that I, a mentor told me is you've got to, if you're going to be sort of like this, if you want to be a CEO of a billion dollar company, you need to create support systems like that now. And so um, having um, help for, for me has been like a really important investment so that we um, can sort of like do life. But I try and be present with my kids. It's, it's hard. Sometimes I'm churning on a business issue and I just can't, it's like I can't stop thinking about it. It's hard. But you said imperfection. Is that something you, uh, something you sort of learning to let go or just not stressing yourself out to be perfect in, in, in everything or even anything? I guess the easier way to phrase this question is what's your uh, attitude about perfectionism in general? Yeah, I mean, I am definitely obsessive. And so I really like to, if I'm going to, if we're going to create something, I want to go really deep. And, you know, if there's a blog post, that it's like one piece of content that's going out to parents. I'm like obsessively focused on, is this of service? And is this getting enough rounds of edits? But I think it's also just having whole categories that you're letting go of. So for me, again, the category of having like a sort of like perfect house or this like, you know, great scenery behind me, like, you know, looking good all the time or whatever it is, is you have to kind of say, I'm going to let go of that category. Um, but in business for my work, I think it's, I'm, I'm really, I'm really a believe in deep focus and I believe in, um, taking time to do things that don't scale and listening to customers and talking to customers and, um, and really kind of, um, Obsess, obsessing. I'm like pretty obsessive about certain <laughs> aspects of work. Yeah, but that's good. Yeah. What What are the parts of, of yourself do you need to scale as as your business scales? You you mentioned letting go of certain things, and and obviously something that's mentioned quite a lot is to learn to delegate and and maybe not obsess too much about certain stuff. But what what are uh, things have you learned uh, some some tricks as as uh, our listeners also grow their businesses and and get busier and busier and maybe have have something to balance uh, uh, it can be a family but it can be a relationship or whatever um so are there some some good uh, tips you've found uh, along the way yeah i mean i think that, that we're all always working on things and this doesn't sound very like really revolutionary or anything but i'm i am working on listening and really kind of setting um, an intention. Sometimes we have our vision as, a, as an entrepreneur for what how we, we've been thinking about this deeply. We know how it should go. And so we walk into a meeting and just, you know, there's this balance of not really wanting to have patience to like listen to other people processing and kind of getting to where you are, but then also creating space to be challenged. And so what I'm working on now is kind of saying, if, I, if I'm Go, coming in strong on something, I say, I'm, you know, I'm going to give you my perspective on this. And then I really want to hear you push back. And I really want to hear all of your opinions on, you know, how this could go wrong, or what could, and then just have the discipline to listen. Um, so I've been kind of trying to figure that out because if I just start by listening and telling myself I need to listen more, then it feels like you're wasting a lot of time because it's like, you're listening, you're like, wait, but I've already thought through this and I've already, you know, gone here. And so I've been really working to kind of figure out that balance um, because I think having a team that really feels like they can challenge and um, push boundaries and, you know, ask hard questions and ask the CEO and the co-founders, you know, hard things feels like the healthiest way to scale a team. So just one of the probably hundred things I need to work on, but <laughs> it's the one I'm focusing on right now. Yeah, but listening's big. And, and I think a lot of people recognize that uh, who... Uh have that same thing. I already went through that sentence in my mind. Why are you finishing it? Like, I already know what you're going to say, basically. Uh, but it, it, what, what do you think that is? Do you think it's an ego thing or is this something else? Where, where does it come from that? I mean, obviously, it's subjective. Everyone has probably their own. Uh, but what's because uh, you said you're working on this, probably thinking about this. So how what do you th how does it sort of look like in your mind when you try to be more more of an active listener? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's about enthusiasm. Like I just, am like really enthusiastic and passionate and sort of like take up the space in, in yeah. a, in a situation. And I think I just, so, so not looking at it, like I'm trying to, you know, bulldoze over people or I'm just like this, like 
person that's egocentric that all they want to do is just talk about themselves. I think it's really kind of recognizing where is this coming from. And for me, it's um, sometimes it's coming from a place that I don't like in myself, but it's also, I think in this case with listening, it's about like, I'm just excited and I'm enthusiastic. And I like, I'm, I'm like been thinking about this a lot and you know, kind of, I have a pretty, you know, um, fast motor around like <laughs> thinking about things. So um, yeah, I think it's recognizing that and then creating the space for it, but um, just creating the space to work on it. I think I'm sure that if I, you know, I hear about these entrepreneurs that have the morning routines and for me, every morning is different because our kids, you know, we had a nightmare last night. And so, you know, just, just, it's, it's, it's not, there's, there's not a whole lot of space for, for the, for the journaling and the, you know, I've got my, like, I do my special coffee and then I go for a run and then I journal and I'm up at five and I'm doing all these things. It's just not like that with kids at home. So I think for me, it's just about kind of setting these smaller intentions and trying to yeah. make progress. I think that that's refreshing to hear also because you you hear all these superhero stories about people like Tim Cook wakes up at 4 a.m., then does two hours of email, then does this and this and this. Like, when does he sleep? Like, who 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 are these yeah. persons? Where yes. does he live? Yeah. 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 Uh, but but obviously there's like uh, different ways to go about it. But one one thing that came to mind that we we've done now a few of these slush episodes this fall, uh, but something that we haven't uh, tapped into that much yet is actually leadership. Uh, in in general, so that would be maybe interesting to to touch upon a, a bit also since you've obviously had quite a lot of, um, well you've had to learn now also more and more during the the last years um, about leadership and and maybe packaging that as you should never do with a with a second question uh, is is that I saw that you've you've uh, taken an MBA, um, so maybe also looking at that has that helped you as a entrepreneur and and maybe also as a as a leader. It's interesting because, you know, when you say leadership and leader, like I feel like there's like a lot of weight to those words. And I wonder if it's also about just sort of having humility to sort of serve just what having a purpose and being really passionate about that purpose and then letting it sort of organically fold to letting um, the team make, you know, just or the people that you're co-creating with, I'll say. Um, letting them run with things if it feels if it feels right to your kind of like vision and intuition and then kind of stepping in and saying, okay, I've gone deep on this. And, and if there's scanning for issues and then going deep on something and scanning for issues and going deep um, feels like the more of the approach. Um, it's just interesting. I I think some people think, okay, I'm going to practice leadership. I'm going to, you know, be a leader. And I almost feel like there's like an ego to that, I guess, that I um, don't relate to as much. Um, MBA was so confidence building. I think for me, it's about just making sure that I, I, I always time and time again, when you're trying something new, you just, it's hard. And, you know, there's, there's that self doubt and everybody has it. And then kind of overcoming that. And for me, just feeling like I could be really, there wasn't, there wasn't this sort of mysterious knowledge, body of knowledge that, you know, real business people knew that I didn't. And so, you know, it's less about the tangible, you know, sort of like, what did I learn in these classes? It was more about, you know, just the network, but also the confidence. Like I could, you know, I can do well in accounting. I never thought I, you know, I never thought I could. And just things that where you kind of like overcome um, in a space and then be able to kind of, but the, the best entrepreneur of the best experience has been building these companies. I and mean, that's so much more learning than you could ever learn in a class. Yeah, there's this there's this idea that, or at least it seems like there's this uh, idea that leadership is some sort of set of fixed attributes that are specific, and to be a good leader, you have to uh, cross a few boxes, otherwise you're not a leader. And maybe to an extent, yes, there are like similarities between good leaders to an extent, maybe. But I mean, do, do you agree that it's it's about, uh, I mean? being genuine and some sort of coherence with who you are. I mean, at least for me personally, I, I can't imagine anything worse than a than a leader who's maybe a bit more quiet, a bit more toned down, who leads with example and is is not the type of hype person coming into the coming to work the next day, having read a book and just suddenly being like, let's everyone now, let's uh, let's gather to, around and like, everyone's going to be like, you're you're not you anymore. What are you, what are you doing? Yeah. Do you think there's something? I love that. that. 
I think that's so true. I hadn't thought about that it, that way, but yes, just being your authentic self and and being driven by, I think, um, it, trying to trying to separate where your where your drive is coming from, mm. and am I driven because of this sort of like I have to fit this version of success that I was taught is going to be um, acceptable for my future or will mean mean that I'm good versus just like, who who am I really? Like, what do I really care about? And how do I live that purpose and just be my full self in the process? I think um, one of the, th- you know, sort of ha- I have a friend who helped me create sort of a life purpose statement and it's just living, giving and receiving everything I can in each moment, you know, just like, how can I just really live and like really give and really receive deeply um, you know, with, with, with whatever's happening, um, you know, sort of an aspirational intention because there's a lot of us that we're just on autopilot sometimes, but yeah, yeah I think authentic self is big. Yeah. It seems like quite a <clears throat> typical entrepreneur, uh, answer to the leadership question. I recognize that answer myself. And at the end of the day, it's probably like people want to follow you and your vision. And it's not about like being too fussy about, uh, really leading people, but maybe to, to, Isn't there like one layer of processes or like, is that, is that tied to leadership? Because you have all these like questions about how you measure performance and give feedback and, and build a team that, you know, create common goals. And then at cer- certain points, uh, you scale to certain like revenue marks, you, you maybe bring in someone with a different background and, and like, you see this quite a lot in, in companies and this discussion as well. So is this like, is this part of the leadership discussion still and something you, you, you need to do, or, or do you think like the, the leadership is fundamentally just, you know, people following the founders and the vision and, and being there because they believe in, in that, um, uh, that, uh, yeah, the vision <laughs> and the founders in, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, it's probably both, which is, I think, I mean, I really strongly believe in co-founding companies. I feel like it is really hard to be a one person. I don't know what it's like, but I know that I am so, that the that, that love every would not be what it is without my co-founder, Rod, and that we are really balance each other and, you know, push, we, we, we really we show up very differently and we have a very different, we worry about different things and we process different things, but we're in kind of this kind of deep, deeper kind of trust place with each other because we've known each other for a long time. Rod is actually my um, best friend's husband. And so my best friend from growing up, so I've known him for you know, 20 years, like from the the weekend that he met, you know, just the weekend after he met my, my best friend. So he's, so I've, I know him really well, yet we're very different. And so I think um, it's interesting. I think he would have a totally different answer to this. My, my, my kind of, process is um is to sort of is to just scan and then go deep and scan for scan for potential and then go really deep um for potential issues or opportunities and um and then just like obsessively go deep and then kind of emerge and then sort of that is on its way and you know there's alignment and we're we're in flow and then kind of come up for air and then go where where am i going into next and i think that Um, Rod's process is very much like from a very rational place. What does this organization need to scale? What's our, you know, what does the team look like? Where are we headed? Um, so it, it's, yeah, I don't know that I answered your question. I think you did. But I think, but, it, yeah, but, it, but it, there are like certain, certain layers and it probably depends on the persons and that's why it's good to have, uh, different personalities because then if you only have one person who, who maybe. I don't know. It, it probably depends on, but I, I think that answered the question in sense. And you can maybe write a book on, on dolphin leadership. I think that's a good like <laughs> <laughs> approach. Um, yeah. What are some of the things uh, you've, in, in your mind that um, are misunderstood about entrepreneurship or stuff that we don't speak uh, out loud about enough? Because it's kind of idolized in in one sense, and, and I'm yes. talking especially about the the tech entrepreneurship part, and. Um, It shouldn't be, I think, because there's like, it's not that easy in, at the end of the day. I totally agree. And it's, I, I don't think, I don't know that entrepreneurs possess, I think that there's this kind of idolization as you, just as you said, and, and it's like that there's this sort of like magical, there's like a magic in what they possess. And it's like, you know, so unattainable and hard to connect with. I think that it's, um, obviously a lot of hard work and obviously um, 
there, there's a, there's just so much that goes into it, but they're just like, we're all like, you know, we're all regular people. Like you, you all, you both are, you know, we're just, we're just doing our best. We're just, we just, you know, I think that, um, I feel really grateful. And I think that it was interesting that you brought up this sort of like one, one vision sort of, you have one big company that you want to build and in your lifetime versus, you know, a lot, having a lot of ideas and there's, it can show up in different ways. For me, I don't have a hundred more business ideas. I feel like, you know, I co-founded a company with, with Happy Baby. My co-founder had the idea for our company with Love Every. I had the idea for the company, but I don't feel like I have like, you know, a hundred more in me, you know? So I think that it's, it's just about kind of like, this is sort of my path and, um, but I do think that there's like this, yeah, this miss, this like, seems like there's something really special about entrepreneurs. And I think that it's actually just, anybody can be an entrepreneur, you just need to work really hard and have a vision and, um, and try and push, push down, you know, kind of like the self doubt and know where your emotions should stay in terms of that doubt, you know, put them in a place and then just get going, get working you know, dig in, um, yeah, I, I agree with that. And are there what what other qualities do you think, or what would you recommend for someone who is looking to start their own own, own company uh, and doing taking the first steps? Should you go all in, strong focus, uh, and and then just trying to create something, you know, big? It's not maybe it's not a value in itself. It doesn't need to be huge to be successful. I think that's one other discussion <laughs> that's uh, that we have quite a lot. Uh, but you know, what, what steps should you take if you're looking into your, you've been thinking it about it now for maybe a few years and then you, now you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> so, and, and, and you're thinking about, okay, if this answer is good, I'm gonna, I'm gonna found, found a company and, and get going with my idea. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely talked to a number of entrepreneurs in that very place. And oftentimes what I find myself kind of saying to them is what, just lay it out. Like, what is, what is the next step and the next step after that? And then you're going to learn more. And then you do that next step and just creating a real discipline around one foot in front of the other and just learning and having, um, I think that sometimes when we are driven by sort of like how excited we are by our idea that day, depend like is is what drives how much progress we make on our business concept. And so because when it's in your head and it's not real and out in the world, it's it's a very kind of vulnerable thing. It's like some people might be you might have a conversation with somebody, you feel really encouraged, feel really excited, like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this happen today. And then you have another conversation and you feel really discouraged and you know, and you're like, ah, it's not really, it's not really worth it. And so then you don't really make progress. You're like stopping and starting and stopping and starting. And I think for, for me, it's very much about separating and just saying, I am going to, in this process, I will, I have to do this and I'm going to learn so much in this process. I'm going to not work. I'm going to set aside whether I think it's amazing or dumb based on what I, you know, who I spoke with or how I, what I'm obsessing about or worrying about. What are the, like the 15 things that I need to do over the next two months to, have a better understanding of this business and move this whole thing forward. And, and even if things look not promising as you're marching through those 15 things, you stay on that path and you march through and you keep doing, because in doing you learn so much. And then that's, what's kind of created like so many people, you know, you sort of, um, that's the magic is in like actually taking action. And it's so hard to take action when it's not out in the world yet. It's so hard to do that early building. Yeah. That's interesting that so you, motivation isn't always the the sort of uh, forward pushing juice that that you you can rely on which which uh, mm-hmm. which then I don't know what the other word would be like what what, what would you what would you call the Just other like uh, force grit just like grit Grits. with like without a whole lot you just without even a whole lot of purpose always like right. just gritty hard work without even knowing what you're working towards always, um, no matter what sometimes, and then the inspiration comes, right? Yeah. Because then you learn and right. then you can get there and then you have a real thing out in the world, but you've got to, you've got to just, it's so hard, but you just got to work really hard for, you know, sort of, it might feel aimless at times, Yeah. but you right. just know, but you know, logically that that's, you know, you're setting aside your emotions and you're just saying, I gotta, I gotta do, I gotta work hard. I gotta yeah. do this thing that I said I was going to do. There's yeah. a purpose for this work, and I know it, if, even if I don't feel it today on this Monday, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the kicks you get from success, uh, if 
as long as they're much bigger than the, the negative feelings you get from most other days when you don't get the kicks from the success because that's that's the life usually um so as long as those kicks come big enough and and often enough uh, it's probably going to help you move forward but then um yeah you just need to i think it's very uh, you get hooked on the kicks pretty quickly once you start you know yeah. whether it's the first customer first product funding round or selling something whatever it's as you're building it it feels it feels totally different when you are actually succeeding and creating someone says yes to you uh, as most days you know <laughs> you get punched in the face basically um until maybe at some point you don't get punched that often anymore but yeah. <laughs> yes yes great metaphor great metaphor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, but uh, and isn't it, isn't it sort of uh when you look at it in hindsight uh those difficult days are what uh builds up the feeling of you actually feeling like you deserve what you got afterwards yes. Yes. And and I worked for this. This is this d- didn't just came come uh, automatically because I had good days and everything just flowed and I rode away. I had to actually you had to actually like sometimes you fell down. You had to come up and and uh, and uh, yeah, grit is this is the word you use. I like that word. Yeah, because uh, I guess you need both. Yeah, I also go to. I mean, I also also I think just before I go to sleep at night, I just it's like sort of like this habit that I have, but I just envision myself, you know, with Love Every, with Rod and I co-founding this company that's like multi-billion dollar brand. And I just, I just kind of visualize like how that feels and what that looks like and the impact of that, that company and, and just really try and kind of flesh that out. So I think holding the highest vision while also just being really gritty about the details is sort of that, that balance, um, that can get you there. Maybe as a last question, um, we would like always to end on a positive note, but I'm gonna still ask this because so very Finnish <laughs> and, uh, question, but what at this point you've grown quickly, you have investors on board, you have traction, uh, metrics are improving. What is something that could, you know, uh, ruin your business? Uh, what's something that could actually um, just stop you in your tracks? Uh, it wasn't COVID that was great for you. So mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's mm-hmm. a, better, a better situation than for most, but, do you do this kind of scenario thinking or or are you paranoid still about maybe this won't work? Yeah, I'm I'm totally believe in paranoia. Like I I really believe in optim there was some some article about entrepreneurs being both simultaneously really optimistic and then also very paranoid. Yeah. And I, that really resonated <laughs> with me. I feel like I really live that. Um I'm always, you know, really focused on our quality and safety. And you know, something if we had a you know, a safety issue, a quality issue, you know, we could really hurt our brand reputation and it could, and, you know, could really hurt a child. That would, that's the responsibility that I really hold deeply. Um, and, you know, it's the risk of, of, you know, running a business like this. I, I feel like I've kind of gotten used to that risk with, with scaling happy family and, um, feeding babies, having, you know, babies, um, play things and learning tools is a lot easier than feeding them. So that's been good, but it doesn't mean that, you know, I don't, you know, totally um, respect and and just have so much appreciation and focus on the, the importance of safety and quality and, and our relationship with our factory. We've got a, you know, kind of world-class factory that also really worries. And so I think um, that, that that would, let's just be really, want to be, want to be a downer. <laughs> That that's it yeah. that in yeah. my mind yeah. could be a big a big issue, yeah a big issue like that could could really take us down. Yeah, we was uh, the chairman of Nokia who actually he's talking always about uh, paranoid optimism. Um, so that's yeah. that's kind of the expression. But uh, after listening to you for one hour, Jessica, we, I think we I can speak for Isaac and myself that we're fully confident that you're going to continue on a uh, equally impressive journey. And we're looking forward to following following everything you do with your company in the in the coming years. Right, well, we just launched in Europe, so we're very excited to kind of be oh, great. Um, in your area Super. now. So welcome, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the, I'm not the mayor of Europe, but welcome still. <laughs> <Mayor>. <laughs> yeah, not, uh, not yet. No, not yet. No, but that's my aspiration. Yes, uh, but thank you. This is appreciate the appreciate the personal conversation. Actually, this this uh, uh, got very uh, sort of intimate in a way, and I really appreciate it. Thanks for the answers. 
Great. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And and thanks to all the, the listeners and viewers. Uh, comment comment on the video and tell us what your favorite toy is. And then we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs> Bye. Do you write these? Do you write these before the episodes yes. or do you just come up with no. them? <laughs> thanks. Thank Stay safe Bye-bye. listeners. Bye-bye.